if you tweet at me and this is kind of this has happened before please don't do it during the talk uh, or it will probably come up on the screen but we can also do this interactive and I'm going to be really mean afterwards to you but uh, let's just see how this goes okay um, so it's the last scene of the game and by the way there might be spoilers uh, in there for Lion Song for the first episode um, so if you want to play it you can just leave <laughs> I'm kidding. So, there's gonna be spoilers. Uh, it's the last scene of the game. Our protagonist has gone through the worst. Uh, it's time for the payoff. But something's not quite right. It feels bland. This scene, it feels bland. It feels boring. Not, not like an ending at all. So, bear this picture in mind because we're going to come ba back to this later. But in the meantime, uh, I'd like to say, hi guys. Um, my name is Stefan and I'm really happy to be here, uh, not just because I've never visited Graz and it's a beautiful city, but as you all show very well today, you have a great community here, like a great game dev community and that's something that's really important um, for the scene to flourish. So congrats to that, I guess. <laughs> um, some of you might ask yourselves, who is this guy? up there, like down there on the stage <laughs> um, with the beard and the awesome Adventure Time t-shirt um, who comes here to our community uh, game dev get together um, and turns out I'm a game designer I'm a game designer game designers are the people who think of the concepts and the, uh, and, and the mechanics that go into the game and also the themes and much more and I've been that uh, for the last five years at Mipumi Games in Vienna <clears throat> however being a designer, at least at Mipumi, and I'd even arg argue at most companies in Austria, uh, means wearing a lot of hats. So I also do art, I do PR, I create marketing assets and video stuff sometimes. Um, actually, my, my boss at Mipumi, he's going to give a talk later today, and I'll, I, I suggest that you all go there <coughs> to see what Mipumi is actually working on. Um, don't miss it, and no, I didn't get paid to say this. So, whenever I'm not working at Mipumi, which basically takes up most of my time, um, I still make games uh, on the side, like private projects. Um, and I do so under this name, which is my Twitter handle, it's Leaf Thief. Um, yeah, um, I use this really as something of my label, I guess, to create media and games outside of my day job. And one of my biggest passions is uh, participating in game jams like Ludum Dare. And for all those who don't know, a game jam is basically something of a friendly competition uh, among peers, I guess, um, that uh, where you have to make a game in 48 hours or 72 hours. And Ludum Dare here, it's the biggest online game jam there is. Um, I love doing them. I love doing these game jams because they basically take you through the whole cycle of game development, but in a really short amount of time. You think of an idea, you start working on it, you refine, you cut, because you have to cut. You refine again, you cut again, you barely finish, you upload a build, and then people will start playing your games and commenting on it. And especially in the Loom there, uh, like jamming community, it's getting feedback from other developers. They've gone through the same thing that you uh, have gone through in the past 48 hours. So game jams, in short, are the best. Um, I prepared a little video, but I'm going to skip that. Um, for all those who don't think um, you can make a game in 48 hours or 72 hours, uh, just type in Ludum there, time lapse on YouTube, and you're going to see it tons of videos of people recording themselves while making these games. So, turns out, Loom Dare 36 is happening right now. It's online, so you can just go there, loomdare.com uh, slash compo. Um, and for all of you who are, who, who are kind of like, I, um, yeah, I want to try that, you can just, uh, again, get up, I'll give you a second or so. And Get up and start making games, start jamming. Okay. Um, I didn't really expect anyone uh, 
to stand up. But it would, would have been cool, cool though. <laughs> okay, so here's a little track record uh, of games that came out of game gems, like my games. Um, it's not all of them, but like a few of the more knowns, I guess. This is One More Night, it was made for a Game Boy Jam, where you have to like uh, create a game within the limitations of uh, the Game Boy, which is 160 by 144 pixels, um, and four colors, obviously. Um, it's a game about like uh, a late summer camping trip among your friends, like as a teenager, uh, it's a visual novel. Then for Lunar last year, I created this uh, game, this point and click adventure game about beauty, uh, like about the theme of beauty. And the theme was you are the monster and you actually play as my take on Frankenstein's monster. Um, and then this is a game about dementia, also a pixel art uh, point and click adventure game. Uh, it's called 10 Weeks. And this started um, in a monthly AGS competition, which is a competition among users of the engine uh, Adventure Game Studio. And this is probably one of the most knowns, I guess, which is the Lion Song, which we're cu currently developing uh, at Me Pumi. So the first episode is out. And this actually started exactly two years ago. Uh, I did the very first version of the Lion Song of the first episode. Um, in the Ludum Dare 30 competition. Yeah, 30. So, um, again, a short pause for all those of you who just like kind of bored, don't know what to do, because that's why you sit here. No, 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 no not really. <laughs> you can just go and play the first episode for free on Steam. So, now that we're, oh, I'm, I'm finished with all the ads and, and stuff. Um, this basically answers who I am. Um, now you might ask yourselves uh, why you're here. And that's probably because someone somewhere thought I had something smart to say. So let's just go with it. So today I'm going to talk about one of, one of the best feelings in game development, in game creation. Uh, and it's not the best feeling, and this is like my, my personal three best feelings in game development uh, list, um, which is obviously led by this one. Finishing a game and getting positive feedback, uh, also known as jamming, <laughs> like game jamming. Um, I've talked about this enough. Then serendipity, which is what I'm going to talk about today. And then the third one would be implementing something and getting it right the first time, which barely ever happens to me. <laughs> Because you like you try to implement something and, and implement it as design, but then it usually takes two or three iterations until you get close to its right. So, what is serendipity? Where does it occur, and how can you like facilitate it? Um, these are basically the, my little agenda for today. So we'll dive right in. Serendipity. I'm not going to talk about uh, Serendipity, the character as portrayed by Selma Hayek in the hit movie of 1999, uh, Dogma, but rather Serendipity that's defined as happy accident, fortune happenstance, pleasant surprise. And as these definitions tell you already, um, it has something to do with surprise, with something unexpected, but then also sometimes unintentional mistakes, like here. Um, I think this was uh, the coverage, NBC coverage of the Olympics, uh, where they put this little bar right there where the speedo of the swimmers is, um, which is kind of nice. Makes it way more er erotic. Um, but then it's also often defined, or, or like uh, it has a connotation of inspiration. Uh, for example, when Sir Isaac Newton was attacked by a manic apple. The falling fruit facilitated Newton's finding of the theory of gravity. But that was just random, right? Or so one would think. But his theory didn't just appear out of nowhere, like some god-given gift. He must have been working on it well. Uh, he must have been working on it already. In fact, I think it's precisely because he's been working on his theory of masses and probably gravity. Um, that all he needed was the nudge in the right direction for him to 
see for it, for him to make it, for for everything to make sense. It's the moment when you're working on something and are suddenly inspired by an error or, or accident that drives you to the realization of new insight or a solution you weren't looking for to a problem you didn't even know existed. And you're probably asking yourselves, hey, um, can you show us some examples? Uh, yeah, I can. Um, for example, Rocket League. But this is like more an anecdote I heard somewhere, so this is not verified. But Rocket League is basically soccer with rocket-powered cars, and it's great! <laughs> uh, um, it's very success successful um, and really big and an eSport um, and I guess it was that moment when some designer at Psyonix uh, decided to hey we have this ballerina of battle cars that are rocket powered and I'll just drop a soccer ball in there not really knowing what I'm doing um, but then the result was great so they processed they looked at what was there they were driving around, shooting a ball with rocket-powered battle cars. Um, and they processed what was there and found out it was good and that it was fun. And it was, again, that moment of serendipity um, where they decided, okay, this is going to be a soccer game with rocket-powered cars right now. Um, and obviously it was very successful and they were probably after after getting it out and it became it becoming a really big success or like this so a few examples um, from my games um, from the lion song um, where there was a moment of serendipity that really helped uh, finish the game in a sense so we go, we're going to back to the scene uh, the concert in the lion song which is the last scene. Um, we're at the end of the first episode. Wilma, our protagonist, she has literally gone through a storm to get here to finish her musical composition. This is the scene where everything was supposed to finally pay off. Okay, it wasn't the primary climax in the story, but at least the secondary climax in the story. <clears throat> it was the moment when all the choices she and the player made throughout this game to this point um, where if the choice is formulated in one final musical piece. But, as I said, the scene was boring and bland. So, um, I was thinking of ways how to improve this, because the ending is obviously the most important part and you want to leave your players with something they can remember. So, I started playing the music and um, and showing Wilma as she played our music, and that wasn't just just wasn't enough. So I remembered the ending of another game, not the ending, but actually the credits of another game I really dearly loved, which is Journey. Um, and we're going to watch this really quickly. Really. Just a sec. Anticlimactic, right? Never mind. Fuck it. <clears throat> so we're just going to do this without YouTube videos. And we're starting way... way. Okay. You're almost there. It's a lot of slides. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, so what the Crash and Journey do, uh, what they do there is 
basically they take you through all the scenes through your journey through the player's journey um, but in reverse chronological order you, so you start at the end and, and end at the beginning um, and um, as it goes great artists steal so I figured hey I'm going to do the same thing uh, in Lion's Song um, so what I wanted to do was I wanted uh, to show all the scenes as she played her music um, and the way I wanted to implement it was or the way I had to implement it was basically disabling the Wilma character and then uh, changing the background textures and cycling through, through all the previous scenes then switch back to the concert wait for the music to finish and basically her take to take her bows but when I implemented it I forgot about one thing which was uh, like disabling the sprite of Wilma so it ended up being and here's another great video yeah um, that you can see <laughs> thanks um, so what happened was she was there playing her song and then this, the game would cycle through all the previous scenes as, as I said and it was like um, she remembers everything, everything she's worked through to come to this point as she's playing her music. Almost as if through her music she elicits these feelings, the emotions and, and, and basically her journey that you as a player witnessed alongside her. The visual design guidelines, so this was basically the mistake, so I, I didn't disable her. Um, or I didn't switch off her texture uh, and the visual design guidelines really uh, made it possible that uh, it didn't look strange because everything in the foreground is basically in the star color so wherever she was standing it just worked and the result was pretty good and I'm very satisfied with it because we could we suddenly had the, the uh, possibility to leave the player with something uh, something that was very much in the tone of the game okay another example 10 weeks um, in 10 weeks um, um, you play as Stephanie uh, she's a mother and she's suffering uh, a stroke and, and um, the, the, the basically the game is about um, the effects of dementia so this is the very first scene Stephanie comes home after a hard day at work and just wants to relax in her garden with her flowers on a swing where she witnessed her teenage daughter grow up you can almost feel the evening air the lights humming silently as a chilly breeze lulls you into the choir of the stars above you ah, so tranquil but to contrast the feeling i wanted to visualize stress somehow because she came home after a stressful day um, and um, i heard somewhere on the radio that and some radio doctor or show or something uh, how stress can be portrayed as uh, or can be imagined as white noise so in addition to the white noise I, I played um, I, I looked for basically a stressful visualization um, which was which was that it was basically a, a, an animated sprite I, I laid over the scene um, to in, in this attempt to capture stress so I put it in the game and <laughs> here Adventure Game Studio, the, the engine I used, really comes to shine because um, I wanted it to be rendered above the game scene so I had to use objects which are usually used for something like objects you can pick up in the scene or uh, animated sprites really so I had to implement this full screen uh, texture as an object and what's really cool about this is that um, Adventure Game Studio handles the click detection for you. So um, what happened was the the clicks were basically invalid or rendered invalid because um, Adventure Game Studio makes this alpha detection of the sprite. So you have these transparent. Um, um, areas in between and then the black areas and wherever there's actual color Adventure Game Studio would think hey this is an object that's clickable right so what happened was <clears throat> I was suddenly unable to click through 
Um, in this scene, she was supposed to, you, you as a player, you were supposed to find like um, objects that would calm her down, like the night sky or the lights in the back. Or, or just objects where that, that elicited memories of earlier. But you suddenly you weren't able to. Well, you were able to in the areas where the visualization wasn't. So everywhere where black was not. And <coughs> I, I saw it as an error, but then it turns out this was really good because it amplified this feeling of stress of the inability to do something so um, the way it played out was you really had to get the moment right to click on the objects that would calm her down and then um, as I had this moment of serendipity where I saw okay this actually obstructs player interaction I ran with it so I did two more versions of this stress visualization but that were continually toned down so that the player had the feeling of progress so whenever you clicked um, a, a basically a, a, an object that calmed her down um, I would change the visualization and it had that effect of okay loosening up and um, they had like a progress indicator of how calmed down she is so it got easier and easier until they finally arrived at this scene where they could finally relax, she could finally relax, and the players alongside the character, and uh, enjoy the scenery before the ma next major story beat. So this serendipity thing sounds pretty good, so why not do it all the time? <laughs> um, yeah, this brings me to the how. How you can facilitate serendipity. Um, and this is kind of the sobering part, because I don't think you can because because it, it has these random qualities but um, there are ways to enable these moments and you need I think you need two things for that and the first one is an environment to make errors because um, when you when you basically start a game from scratch and have nothing you can't make any errors because there's nothing there that the errors could affect and then you also need to be watchful. Uh, you, you have to mind these mistakes and, and look at them very closely. Um, you have to pay attention to your mistakes. Because where someone, some other person would see the mistake or something that's not supposed to be, you will be able to see the beauty. And since there's not been any videos, we finish early. Again, also with Twitch, you can you can ask questions. Um, just sorry, <laughs> just post the questions to the Twitch channel if you have any. As you talked about getting it right the first time, how much of your original um, game from Lumumba is still in the line song that is released now? Uh, most of it is just bigger. So. You got it right the first time, you could say. No, because it was, it was too short. <laughs> um, when we started the Lion Song um, uh, and talking about making it at Mikumi, um, one of the first things, uh, like uh, my boss has said, um, okay, this is way too short because it lasted about five or seven minutes. So we had to, to basically blow it up and, and make it bigger. Which was, which, which really proved to be a hard task because you basically had a full story there, uh, just lasted didn't last long, um, and we had to like work out ways to to pro prolong the experience, but in a way that wasn't just okay. We'll just put some puzzles in there that block the player's progress. Um, it had to be something meaningful because um, I wanted players. Uh, to basically tell, tell the story alongside the game, which is why 
many people will call it a visual novel, which is basically totally okay for me. <laughs> but uh, it means um, more text, more story, basically. More questions from the audience. Hey, um, did you ever run into like sorry again? Did ever did you ever encounter a situation where like a happy little accident actually created a a, a dead end and you had to start from scratch again? Um, these are just plain mistakes. <laughs> 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 so yeah, <laughs> all the time it's game development. You'll make mistakes, and most of them won't give you new insight or solve a problem for you. Uh, it's just what we do, make mistakes all the time and then sometimes you get it right. <laughs> so is there a special mantra on how to deal with it? Because um, like in the, when I have a creative process and they run into a dead end, of course it's the way you grow, but it's always so heartbreaking. It's, yeah, yeah um, I had a talk about this uh, <laughs> like, uh, two years ago at the Maze Festival which was basically called uh, a graveyard, which was about a graveyard for games. Um, which is the idea of uh, having a place where you put all your like uh, projects that were where you dear to your heart, but you didn't finish. Because otherwise, you would basically just have them on your hard disk, and I have this on my hard disk, and it's terrible. Um, you have these on, on your hard disk, and they're this constant reminder of uh, everything you didn't accomplish, I guess. So, a graveyard has these qualities of um, um, having a fin final resting place um, where you can bring your project in that sense and just deal with them for a very last time. And then you, you could go back to that and like deal with them but on your own terms. Yeah, makes sense. So keep your mistakes around? <laughs> well, yeah, but then also say, okay, just find the point to cut off, um, which takes, um, I guess it takes courage in a sense, because um, I think it's necessary to just have, have it dealt with, uh, uh, yeah, to, to just uh, find closure basically for a project. Um, because it's just so, um, you, you, if you don't do that, you just always kind of think, okay, well, I did. I started this game like two years ago, and it was a really good idea. Uh, and I made two sketches for that, and then had the jump mechanic. Hmm, I could work on that. And this just—it keeps you back. It holds you back from creating new stuff and more stuff, and and getting stuff done. Because there's the there's the project with the two scribbles and the and, and the jump mechanic. But there's also the project where you can dive in, in lava and uh, shoot. Um, and Nazis, I, I don't know. <laughs> I think we have time for one short question and one short answer to that. Sorry. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have two short answers. And we have two short questions. Hi, so thank you for a great talk. I was just wondering, you mentioned the environment to uh, keep the heavy accidents happening. And so what did you get better at your job and actually get more experience and the frequency of happy accidents get lower because you know what you're doing more often? <laughs> Do you um, have anything to do with that? No, that's a valid point, I guess. But then again, always try to do something new, right? This is, not <laughs> this is obviously not a satisfying answer. But I think it would take more time to answer the question, so we can talk about it later. Um, thank you again. This was really wonderful. Um, thank you for having me. I'm super happy to introduce the next speaker, Dietmar from Squad.